Good morning. <clears throat> Before we begin, um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of this uh, day, this new day. We thank you for the gift of your word. We pray <clears throat> that you would bless the sharing, the hearing, and the meditation of your word. Lord, may you be glorified in every line, in every detail of what I'm going to speak uh, this morning, God. I pray, Father, that you would anoint uh, our ears, that we would hear what the Spirit of God wants to speak to his church, your church, and empower us, Lord, to <clears throat> be obedient, to apply diligently what we hear today, oh God. We come this time into your hands. Be glorified, Lord, in the preaching of your word. Be exalted. Bless your people. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> uh, today, I want to speak to you about um, what kind of a church do we want to be? Now, that's a kind of a tricky question because we should resist the temptation of being democratically minded. Uh, we're not here to gain people's opinion and people's votes when we ask a question like that. What kind of a church do we want to be? <clears throat> because true believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, true Christians, <clears throat> understand that we belong to the Lord. We have come to understand that he created us. He redeemed us. He has sanctified us. He has sealed us by his spirit and our everything now and our future is in the Lord. It belongs to him. Every breath of our being, every beat of our heart, every desire, every thought, every longing is to be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his and his alone. And therefore, when a question is put like this, what kind of a church do we want to be? We surely should not do the mistake of looking outside in the world and saying, hey, how can we be a cool community? How do we uh, be uh, getting into the bling of things? We're not here to look for the answer to this question outside in the world. <clears throat> and uh, we also have to resist the temptation of trying to compare ourselves with other church communities. So we ought to value what God is doing in and across his body, not only in our city, but across our nation and across the globe. And, and we should be able to understand and even appreciate how the Lord has um, uh, worked uh, through the generations. And we are a uh, part of the global and the universal church that God has been redeeming from every nation, tribe, language, and people uh, across these hundreds and hundreds of years. So when I ask a question like that, what kind of a church we ought to be, where do we get the answer? Pretty simple, in God's word. Because that's where God has supremely revealed his heart, his will, his purpose. He has revealed who he is and what he expects of his people. And that's the kind of people that he's coming back for. That's the kind of people he's right now preparing on this earth. And so we ought to not be democratic because many times the majority has been found to be wrong on the wrong side of scripture and wrong side of God's will and God's plan when we look at the narratives in the Bible. It was many a time, unfortunately, the faithful few who understood the heart of God, I I'm hoping sincerely that that will not be the case with us. I'm hoping that we will be a people who really want to know um, uh, from the scriptures what kind of a people we ought to be. What kind of a church does God expect us to be? So, you know, we look at various metaphors that have been used in the scriptures for us as a people of God, for the church. For example, a very important one, a bride is what we have been called. And a bride wants to please the bridegroom, Jesus. And we want to be prepared. And the bride wants to be prepared for his return. The bride is longing. It's natural for the bride to be longing for the bridegroom. And we see that in Ephesians 5, 22 to 27. 
chapter where Jesus himself is earnestly desiring and uh, preparing his bride to be a bride without any spot and blemish. We also see the metaphor of a servant. We are his servants. We are privileged. We are sons and daughters. We have gift, been gifted sonship. We have been adopted into the family of God. But we are also commanded in that sonship to be servant-like. We are servants. And a servant wants to be faithful, obedient, and fruitful, and be prepared for the master's return. Because when he when the master returns, he wants to hear, well done. We see that in Matthew chapter 24 and 42 to 51, the parable of the faithful servants, even recorded in the other two gospels, and the parable of the faithful servant. And we want to be that faithful servant, obedient, fruitful, and prepared for the master's return. We also want to be children who want to please the father. As sons and daughters, we want to be the father's delight. We don't want to take the father's love for granted. We want to live a life that is pleasing to the father. It's natural, you know, that we, that a child desires the approval and the pleasure of the parent, of the father. And so we want to be that kind of children. And uh, we also want to be a house of the Lord in which the Lord is glorified in his, among his people. He's highly exalted. And he, in, in turn, fills this house, his people, his living house built with living stones. Fill, he wants to fill it with his glory, his power, and, and the blessing of every one of his promises being fulfilled. So how do we see this happen? How does the bride prepare for the bridegroom's return? How does the servant be faithful and obedient to hear well done from the master? How does a son and daughter of the living God pursue a life that is pleasing to the father? How does the church be that house that in which the Lord is highly exalted and the church is filled increasingly, continually with his glory and power? Well, I want to share four things today uh, you know, this is such a broad subject, volumes would go in it. Uh, but I want to share for our benefit four things, primary things that I believe is crucial for us to be the church that the Lord wants us to be. I trust that you're paying close attention and uh, I believe the Lord will speak to you. Number one, the Lord wants us to be a church that loves to pray. God wants us to be a people of prayer. That's what he prophesied through the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before, even hundreds of years before uh, the coming of Jesus. And Isaiah prophesied, my house, thus says the Lord, shall be called as a house of prayer to all nations. That's what God wants his church to be. A church that loves to pray. A church that demonstrates loving dependence uh, on the Father. The church that is full of faith, that believes that the Lord is good and he's faithful and he hears and listens to the prayers of his people. That the Lord who is not slack concerning his promises, but he will, he will hear and answer the, the pleas, the supplications, the intercessions of his people. And so the church must be a house of prayer. And so that's, kind of, that's the kind of church that God loves. A church that has, has made itself, has cultivated a, a love and rhythms and disciplines of prayer. A church that prays all kinds of prayer. You know, I want to encourage you this time to join us for the Friday early morning prayer. It's just for half an hour. And it's a blessing. We even have the monthly worship nights and we want to have it this month. And I want to encourage you to join in, you know, and you will be blessed, you know, because God answers prayer, beloved. Prayer is an activity that is never in vain. When we pray alone or together, when we pray as families, when we pray as a church community, God hears, beloved. God answers prayer. We see that in scripture repeatedly being emphasized. You know, either through testimonies that are recorded or through explicit promises or through explicit commands of the Lord. You know, we are encouraged, my brothers and sisters, to be a people of prayer. 
If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven. Whatever you ask the Father believing in my name, you will receive it. When two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. If two or three agree for anything here on earth, it will be done by my Father in heaven. The prayers of the righteous avail much. Just a few scriptures that I put forth right now to remind us that God wants his church to be a church that loves to pray. Join us on Friday mornings. Join us for the worship nights. You know, we've encouraged the life groups to form Caleb prayer groups. You know, within the life group, get into groups of twos and threes and get on a call during the week and pray for one another. How many of you would love for your brother and sister to pray for you, to hear what you're going through, to pray for your needs, to pray for God to use you mightily, to pray for God to work in you and through you, to pray for the salvation of your loved ones, of your oikos. Why don't you form these Caleb prayer groups in your life groups? Those of you who have stopped, restarted, those of you who have not formed such a group, you know, discuss with your respective pastors and form these Caleb prayer groups. Let's increase prayer in quantity and quality. You can never pray less, beloved. You can never pray, uh, sorry, you can never pray more. You've not, you can never pray too much. Oh, I've prayed too much. No. You can always pray. There's always scope for prayer to increase in quality and in quantity. So I want to encourage us to be a church that loves to pray. Secondly, to be a church that loves truth. You know, we rarely hear of that. You know, one of the characteristics that is mentioned in the book of Acts about the church is that it's the pillar of truth. The God is truth. God is a God of truth. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And we as his disciples ought to be lovers of truth. You know, one of the marks of the last days is that people will love lies. People will love falsehood. But we ought to be a people who love the truth, beloved. We've got to be truth seekers. And so, beloved, we should play, place high value for the reading, the meditation, and the study of God's word. Because in there, in that, we find the truths that God wants us to know and live by. So I want to encourage us to be a people who study the word. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Employ your heart, your mind to feed and feast on God's word. Make deep studies, beloved. Don't be satisfied with superficial flipping of the pages and just reading a little bit here and there you know, uh, haphazardly, uh, impromptu, you know, unsystematically. It won't take us anywhere. It will be seen in our life. It will be seen in the way our lives are so wayward and uh, so meaningless and fruitless. Beloved, when the roots of our life go deep into God's word, into his truths, we shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water, which will bring forth much fruit, and lasting fruit in due seasons. We should also therefore be a people who preach the gospel because that is the most important truth. It's because of that truth that we are saved, that we have received the gift of repentance and new life. We are born again and we have been adopted into the family of God and we have the hope and the assurance of eternal life in Jesus. And therefore, we earnestly desire others to know the truth who don't know the truth, beginning with our loved ones, friends and colleagues. Church that loves the truth will always preach the gospel because we want others who don't know the truth to know the truth. We are restless in a way. And in many ways, till the time the truth is not made known. Also, you know, we ought to not tolerate false teachings. Beloved, that's one of the biggest challenges that church has always faced in history as recorded but all the more in these last days, we will have to be alert. See, beloved, so many of us go on to social media. We go on to YouTube and listening to preachers and Bible teachers. Some of them are questionable, a significant number of them. I won't take names. But beloved, Jesus takes that seriously. In Revelation 2.2, Jesus rebuked the church for tolerating false teaching. 
So beloved, we've got to be careful that we are rooted and grounded in the truths of God's word. We've got to be able to have some understanding of hermeneutics, the, the science of interpreting scripture soundly. If our doctrine is sound, our lives will be sound. If our doctrine is unsound and unhealthy, our lives will be unhealthy. So we've got to be careful about false teachings. And, you know, some of us are tripping on false teachers and, you know, preachers, and we don't have a personal study of God's word. And that's dangerous. And so, beloved, I want to encourage you to pursue your own personal Bible study. You know, get in touch with the pastors. We'll help you, give you some thoughts, share some thoughts and tools with you how to study the word prayerfully and systematically so that you will grow in the truths of God's word and knowledge and in application. So, beloved, we ought to be a church that loves the truth and loves truth. And we want to make the greatest truth known passionately and consistently. And that is the gospel. We also, thirdly, ought to be a church that loves and pursues holiness. Beloved, scripture is very clear. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Our God is holy, beloved. And blessed are the pure in heart they shall see the Lord. And the writer of Hebrews writes in the last chapter, pursue peace and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Beloved, don't take this lightly. We're living in a time where this generation has been given the most number of options to sin. This generation has is faced with a war for its souls where temptation has taken so many attractive forms. But when a child of God says yes to the Lord, this generation's yes will be the loudest compared to other generations in a way. Your yes to the Lord means no to the things of the world. No to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Saying yes to Jesus. I want to follow you, Lord. And because I want to see you, I want to be holy just as you are holy, Lord. You know, beloved, <clears throat> you know, I don't have time to explain this, but I will be doing it not very long. For pretty, pretty soon, I want to be talking about how our anticipation, our earnest expectation of the coming of the Lord is one of the most powerful ways in which the Lord purifies his church. The reason the church will not flirt with the world is because the church wants to be faithful to the bridegroom. The church will not want to flirt with sin. It's because the church wants to see the Lord because the Bible is clear that without holiness, we will not see the Lord. So, beloved, we ought to not tolerate immorality, any form of compromise in our life. Yes, we fall into sin, but we cannot remain there. We cannot justify it. We cannot cover it up. We cannot be comfortable in sin. We ought to be restless till we come into our fellowship with the Lord, restored back through repentance and faith. Beloved, renewal is a very important part of the Christian life. And so we're daily experiencing that renewal <clears throat> by abiding in the gospel, by rehearsing the gospel, and growing in holiness in and by the grace of God. So, beloved, there, there will be a clear distinction between the lifestyle, the values of Christians and those of the world. <clears throat> and so, you know, just remembering the letter of the Apostle Paul in which he says, you are a letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Beloved, our lives ought to be living episodes that we lend credibility to the gospel of the kingdom. Beloved, our lives ought to be a witness of who our God is, that our God is a holy God. Last but not the least, we ought to be a church that loves authenticity. 
Now, this has many dynamics to it. We're not a church. We ought not to be a church that is comfortable with superficiality. You know, saying that, saying that we are Christians, taking the name of the Lord, but then everything or most of our lifestyle uh, gives evidence to the opposite. Beloved, we ought to not deceive ourselves for God is not mocked for whatsoever a man sows, so will he reap. So beloved, let's pursue not superficiality, but authenticity. And there are dynamics at work in this. You know, in the grace of God, we see in scripture there are dynamics. And God, by his spirit, in his grace, will help us to combine those dynamics so that our lives will be authentic. Our spirituality, our faith will be authentic. And I'm reminded of the example of Cornelius. You know, one of the most authentic um, men in the New Testament or even in the Bible. You know, when you look at the story of Cornelius in the book of Acts, you see the kind of impact that Cornelius had. That, you know, he was a God-fearer. The Bible testifies to that. He was a man who feared God. And because of this one beautiful quality or truth, you know, man who feared God, his life was had such a profound impact on his family, even on the soldiers, because he was a centurion, even on the soldiers that he commanded, that he led, that the soldiers would go and testify to the apostle that our master is a godly man, is a God-fearing man. <clears throat> so, beloved, you know, when, I look, when, when, when we look at the life of Cornelius, or you look at the life of other men, we see that they were men and women of authenticity. They didn't have two lives. One that they tried to show to Christians or to the church, and then in other places, they are living something else. Beloved, we ought to be a people who love authenticity, love integrity. That we are the same when we are alone, when we are at home, whether we are with our uh, unsaved loved ones or friends, whether we are out there in the world, in our workplace, where, where would it be that we are the same person? We've got to be authentic. We have our weaknesses. We, we bring that to the Lord and we allow the Lord to work in us and through us and with us so that we are growing in Christ's likeness, which is the greatest purpose of our life. So dynamics like repentance, faith, and spiritual disciplines, pursuing spiritual growth in order to gain and bring forth spiritual fruit. These are very important, beloved. These are vital. You know, <clears throat> prayerlessness, neglect of the reading and study of God's word, neglect of fellowship, thinking that it's okay for me to attend service once in three months or once in six months. Take my word for it, beloved. It's not going to take you anywhere in God. So if there are people who are on this right now, in, in, you know, hearing me, and you know, you've probably logged in after three months, and you don't have a good reason as to why you've been, you've been um, you know, missing fellowship or missing being part of life group. If you don't have a good reason, beloved, I want to tell you, you're not in a, you're not in a safe place. Because the, God uses these dynamics in order to keep us rooted in him and to keep us growing in him. Without that, Christianity will not be possible. You cannot have authentic spirituality. So dynamics of repent, daily repentance and faith and growing in faith and spiritual disciplines of prayer and personal worship and studying of the word and fasting and giving and sharing the gospel and you know, giving to the poor, being generous. These are dynamics at work. And we abide in Christ, appropriate the grace of God in order to function in these dynamics. And as we do that, we begin to see spiritual growth because spiritual growth is not something that happens by mistake. It doesn't happen uh, without us being uh, unaware of it. It is an intentional pursuit and requires discipline. There's no shortcut, beloved. And But the joy of then bringing forth spiritual fruit by abiding in Christ, oh, wow. And, you know, living a life that is of eternal value. That is what we want to see. You know, we don't want to have our works and, the, and, and what, what we are, what our activities, you know, to bring forth a kind of labor and, and results that will be, be of no value in eternity. What, what a horrific 
you know, standing that would be, you know, we just saved, but, you know, we've got nothing to carry forward into eternity. No, Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We ought to pursue that, beloved. And so, beloved, we ought to be a church that loves authenticity. So I want to encourage you this morning, you know, just share these four things um, to encourage you. Yes, there is caution in what I've shared, but that caution is because the Lord loves you and I love you and care for you. And I want to see that, you know, we continue to grow and uh, grow in Christ. And for that, we've got to be heading in the right direction. And so I want to repeat, number one, we ought to be a church that loves to pray. Beloved, join us for the Friday morning meetings. Join us for the worship nights. Form those Caleb prayer groups in your life groups. Dedicate time every week in your life group to pray for each other, to pray for your, your unsaved loved ones and friends and colleagues. You know, believe God for results when we move into the next season of Alpha in, in Jan 22. And uh, my house shall be called as a house of prayer. Let's see that fulfilled in our church. Secondly, we ought to be a church that, that, that loves truth. We ought to be a church um, uh, that, you know, preaches the gospel and, 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 you know, wants people to know the truth that we are abiding in. We also, know, we also have to be a church because we love the truth. We cannot tolerate false teachings. And uh, we got to be careful of what we are hearing and viewing. We also ought to be a church that pursues holiness. This is so important, beloved. We ought to be a church that pursues holiness. And uh, we, we, we see that in scripture clearly that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Our lives ought to be that living epistles that lend credibility to the gospel. Fourthly, we ought to be a church that loves authenticity. Our spirituality should be authentic. You know, the dynamics of repentance, faith, spiritual disciplines at work daily and weekly basis, being in fellowship, being part of the church, being part of life groups, being in, in godly relationships so that we are pursuing authentic spiritual growth to bring forth spiritual fruit, lasting spiritual fruit. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. Um, you know, may we continue to grow in the grace of God. We are in, we are, we are, we are in such a um, pivotal phase in this generation, in this, in this time of the timeline of the human race. Um, we know one thing that the coming of the Lord is nearer than what it ever was. When? We don't know exactly, but we know in the light of God's word that the coming of the Lord is near. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Very soon, um, everything will come to a closure. And especially our lives. Be sober-minded. Be vigilant. I don't want to exaggerate and hype it up. Beloved, don't take the grace of God for granted. Continue to grow in the grace of God. And yes, a church that um, is pleasing to the Lord is a church that even loves one another and loves people. And I want to encourage you to connect with each other, care for each other. You know, let us be a people that truly demonstrate sacrificial love for our brothers and sisters. You know, Jesus said that by this, the world will know that you are my disciples by your fervent love for one another, John 17, 23. So I want to encourage you, beloved, that uh, we love one another, care for one another, connect with people during the week, your brothers and sisters, but don't be loners. And uh, I believe that as we pursue these things, we will be the church that God wants us to be. The Lord bless you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and your precious family. Have a blessed week. Be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.